I'm Nick Boros, space industry analyst and founder of Roto ET Consulting, and I listen to the Cold Star Project. This show is for entertainment purposes only and is not what is termed professional advice. The Cold Star Project is proudly presented by the Operational Excellence Society. Cold Star Tech is a supporter of the OPEX Society, and Jason Canigan is a member of its board of advisors. Talk with us at Cold Star Tech to find out what we can achieve together with your Lean Six Sigma or Operational Excellence programs. And check out opexsociety.org to learn more. This is Jason Canigan, the founder of Cold Star Tech and the host of this show, Cold Star Project. If you are a space or defense founder and you're having trouble with your business development process, we should speak. There are whole areas organizations just completely forget about or don't know about uh, that can really help boost that bid capture rate for you. Also, if you've got a to-do list of, let's call them important but not urgent, things to do that's a mile long and you don't have anybody to get on that, we are the trusted people to install systems and processes in companies like yours. So let's talk about that. Let's get into the show. Back in February of 2022, I visited with Chris Stott on a trip to Florida where I also met Chris Quilty and Andy Aldrin and a few other people, and that was pretty exciting. But uh, I had lunch with Chris, the two Chris's actually, and Chris Stott here was working on a new business. He couldn't tell me much about it, but we're now at the point where he can. Data storage on the moon. Now, when I first heard this idea, I kind of giggled to myself because I know what it's going to take <laughs> to do that. As we'll hear, I've actually been in that field, the auto off-site, out of region backup. Um, this is pretty far out of region. Right? <laughs> so I know, again, what it takes, and I also know the space industry, so I thought, gee, this is going to be expensive. But Chris said, no, no, it's actually more achievable than you think. And so I, the reason I brought him on is that I know Chris has a great sense of history of how we got here and that's very important to me knowing how we got here and the values and the business sense chris would not start a business without knowing that there's customers there now you might laugh at that but i talk to space inventors every week who want to start a business without first looking to see if there's a customer so this is really important let's get into it chris welcome Okay, so Jada. I'm, I'm in one of those moods, so uh-huh. I hope this goes okay. It's all right. It's a Monday so, afternoon. I'll probably keep this in. So data storage on the moon. So what what problem are you solving, Chris? I was a business development manager for an IT firm a long time ago, and I sold out of region offsite automatic backup uh, to keep data out of yeah, hurricane right? zones and things like that. So let's hear about that problem for folks who don't really know what that is. Well, there's, there's an entire industry, as you know, out there, which is dedicated to doing everything you just described, Jason. The idea being that data in this incredible technological age that we live in, this amazing society that we have is software driven. It is a software defined future. Today is data driven. It is people say data is the new oil. I'd say it's actually more important than that. And but data is fragile. As all of us who've hit the delete button, like, no, no, no. I hope I had a backup right. of that. Oh, but it's it's fragile and it's agile, and it can be stored in more more places, you know, at a time than you, than you, yeah than yeah. But what's starting to happen is the amounts of data we're creating as a species is staggering. At two point five quintillion bytes a day, mm. uh, it's it's you know, back in twenty twelve. I think Cisco predicted we might get to an exabyte in twenty thirty. We're already at about. 15, 16 exabytes a year. And by 2030, we're predicted at 50 exabytes a year. Mm. But what that really means is that you and I and our companies and our governments, our state, national, local, everything, we're running on data. And when oftentimes, given climate change, given, you know, good old mother nature with hurricanes, fires, Mm. floods, freezes, brownouts, the cloud, your data could be stored somewhere incredibly well, but the power station Mm. sending energy to that site can have an issue. And it does happen Mm -hmm. an enormous amount of times. And then throw in, you know, data sovereignty and everything else. So how, where do you keep your mission critical, your premium data? How would you keep that super secure? And so as a premium service, where else can you keep it? And so the idea of keeping it outside the biosphere mm. is uh, very attractive to a lot of our customers. And this is the great thing. We're working with customers. This is demand mm. pull, not tech push. Right, right. And so, you know, we looked at satellites and we looked at all sorts of things. And we, we found a, a rather large satellite would work really well for us. Okay, 
we'll, we'll dig into that in a second. That's, right. Right. That's what I said. Yes. I pulled yes. tantalizingly there <laughs> right. for right. a reason. What? Right? That's What's fun. that like? Um, yeah. Okay. So first of all, though, who will use this? Like, how big do you have to be? You gave us a sense of scale. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I was selling this stuff back in like 2008. So even before that, that 2012 figure, and it's ballooned out beyond that. Uh, so who is it? Who is your target market here? How big do you have to be to make this make sense? Well, I, 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 thank you. I mean, mm -hmm. for us, it's, you know, ultimately working as a premium service capacity constraint through the existing industry leaders as resellers, like a wholesale model. Okay. Um, but we're looking at Fortune 500, FTSE 100 companies. We're looking at national governments, state, mm -hmm. local governments as well. And um, we're looking at a government service, a commercial service. And our first customers are a mix of government and commercial. They're very good beta customers. They're great people to work with. And they see the vision of what we're doing. Okay. How did the business case present itself? Uh, it, it's very unlikely you just woke up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat going, oh, I should put data centers on the moon, right? Well, that's just it, saving Earth's data one byte at a time. Mm -hmm. And actually, okay, this, this happened at, uh, at a conference called the TED Conference in Vancouver. Uh, mm -hmm. This would have been in 2018. Okay. And, you know, the apocryphal story, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's just how things happen in life. Sometimes this, it all comes together. Sitting there having a nice breakfast, getting ready to go into the talks, really enjoying it. And the shadow falls across my table. And I'll look up and there's some rather remarkable people uh, from industry who were looking at me and said, you're something to do with space and satellites, right? And I was like, <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> take a sip of the coffee. And they said, okay, we have a problem. Do you mind if we join you? I'm like, please take a seat. And they started going through these issues they were finding about protecting their data and making sure it was safe, making sure it was in the right jurisdiction for data sovereignty laws, which are then starting to kick into high gear. Okay. Right. Data, data, lo data localization mm -hmm. and data intercept and all these different issues. Right. And they were saying, look, we want to start looking And plus the damage that is done through uh, the, the heat and the carbon we use mm -hmm. to generate and look after data centers, which we're improving on. But, you know, we're either going to have an entire planet filled with data. Or as I like to say, or as they said, imagine what could co possibly go wrong if we don't do this, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine a world where we can lose all of our data. We don't have a planetary backup. Okay. And this is a live living backup. So mm -hmm. they said, can you help us? And I, my immediate yeah. answer was yes, of course. <laughs> right. And then they sat down and kept talking. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So what exactly did I just say yes to? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So when a customer comes to you and says, yeah. I, have, I have a need, I'm like, yes. Mm -hmm. That's the most wonderful thing in the world because it means they're trusting you. That means they brought you yep. a problem. They want you to solve a pain point. Well, you've been in sales, Jason. You know what that's mm -hmm. like. It's that magic moment. You're like, oh, right. wonderful. Then I'm like, oh my goodness gracious me, how are we going to do this? So we looked at everything. We looked at low Earth orbit, mid -earth, Leo, Mio, mid Earth mm -hmm. orbit. We looked at geo. We looked, how do we get global coverage? How do we do all these incredible things? How do we do, you know, refresh, restore, and data storage, data sovereignty? And then we went, oh my goodness gracious me. There is the largest satellite in the world. We've all okay. seen it. It's so big, you can see it with the naked eye. It's incredibly stable. Hmm. And the same side of the satellite always points at Earth. We get 24 hours a day. We get global coverage. And the world is going back there. And we can leverage those missions, those technologies. And we did the math. And look, it, it, is, it is counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. And I've spent 30 years in the space and satellite industry in launch vehicles and satellites and spectrum, as you know, right? And I'm like, mm -hmm. for me, I was like, oh, come on, that math can't be right. 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 And we've got a great team of people. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, like Mark Matosian, formerly mm -hmm. of Google, and ISI and Teledesic and more. We've got Carol Goldstein, formerly of Morgan Stanley, ING and AB and AMRO. She ran global telecoms and satellite. And we all looked at the math and we're like, wow, it was cheaper, more cost efficient mm -hmm. for us to do this from the surface of the moon mm -hmm. than it was from low Earth orbit and Neo or Geo. Right. And so that's what we're doing now. We're building a prototype. It heads up this time next year. We're working with Intuitive Machines, fantastic partner there. Skycorp, amazing people are building our first, our first payload for us. We're like a satellite operator. You know, we buy, we don't build. What's that next level of, of uh, move in the new space industry? You know, we're just following mm -hmm. right into what satellite communications does. Okay. And, and that's, that's our model service oriented so uh, I know, I I, no that's great that's great i, that's great. I, I mean my next two questions were how is the executive yeah. team chosen and why is Ooh. it cheaper to build a data center on the moon and we've approached those you know with, with your last couple sentences there so um you mentioned a few people a few key people i mean how do you yeah round people up for this idea 
No, abs- no, excellent question. Right? How do you do this for anything in life? Right? We're mm. working with Boxwood Search and, and Bert finding people for us. Bert Sadler, a unique mm. process, but my goodness, it gets results. Mm-hmm. And, and then the other one is, I, I don't know. I was always, I was very fortunate to have great mentors mm-hmm. in, in life, in, in life, and in my career and stuff. And I've always found that the best way to give an idea the best chance of success mm-hmm. is to surround yourself with the most intelligent, capable, driven people way more intelligent than me, far more experienced, who are very unique and very different to them than each other than myself. Mm-hmm. Set the goal, set the milestone, set the target, tell them the problem to go solve, make sure they have the tools and resources, and then step back mm. and let them do it. Empower them, clear mm-hmm. goals, clear milestones. And that's how we put the team together. I went back through, you know, Palmer said, oh, Chris, that's not fair. And I'm like, sorry, what, what fair? I've got 30 years experience. I went to the brightest people I knew yeah. who would really to, to go to talk to and like look into this idea and like, like, like Dr. Mark Matosian, mm-hmm. you know, he sourced all the data centers and all the material for data centers at Google, built the data center architecture at Google. Mm. They did all these amazing things and then more in satellite. And I was like, wow. And then I did the other thing in sales. If you don't ask, you don't get. Mm-hmm. And I just said, Mark, would you please consider joining us? And he said, yes. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> Right. Same thing with Carol Goldstein on the financing side, right? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've you know, seen Carol teach at the International Space University, worked with her on a couple of companies, seen how she acted at Morgan Stanley, ING and Satellite Finance and Global Telecom at AB and AMRO. I mean, she is like amazing. And I was like, hey, could you please come and help me save our species, save the data, save all the pain and suffering for future going forward, save this technological civilization that we have, help us put in the backup. And she was like, okay, I see what you're doing. I love it. Let's do it. Mm. This is hard. It's a challenge. And mm-hmm. I'm like, yes, it's not easy. Right. And we're using the M word. You know, we'll be just, that's what we call it, Earth's largest satellite. And they're like, well, mm. is it Telesat? What? And I'm like, actually, Telesat's pretty cool. But I'm like, they're like, no, it's even bigger than that. And I'm like, wow. Um, so people, it's been amazing. People have gone, okay, this is, we see what you're doing. We see why you're doing it. And the same thing with our investors. So our lead is Scout Ventures. Mm-hmm. And they have been tremendous, along with Seldor Capital, Two Future Holding, and just joined by the Veteran Fund as well. Okay. And we have Will Hawkins, who just joined our team as our chief data officer, mm-hmm. an expert from the disaster recovery industry. And yeah, we find, here's the problem. Let's find the best person to solve it. Right. Are you a yeah. part of the team? Does the team have opinions? Absolutely. Do they, <laughs> do they have strong opinions? Yes. Mm-hmm. Right, but that's great. That's what you want. You want this like this like this sort of hurricane of ideas mm-hmm. and this people solving issues and solving problems. Right. I mean, when you walk into a room in the space industry, if you're the most intelligent person in that room, you have failed mm-hmm. as a, as as a leader. If you walk into that room and everyone looks like you, you have failed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. We we I mean, since day one, IDIC, infinite diversity, infinite combination. That's our number mm-hmm. one rule uh, for the team. You know, it's like, are you a person of unique and incredible ability that come on in? And by the way, we have a couple of job recs open right now, yeah. director of flight software, and we're getting ready for a chief revenue officer and a few other things. Stay tuned because we were in stealth mm-hmm. for the first three years of doing this. Yeah. Yeah. You and I met in February and I don't think you were ready to talk about it in, uh, in person. <laughs> Live. No, 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 I mean, we yeah. could talk about it briefly, but uh, yeah. You're ready to talk about it publicly. So being capitalized, being capitalized has got to be really nice. Um, So many startups are not properly capitalized, uh, but then again, they haven't proven their business model out. So, you know, you, you were fortunate enough to start on the right end of the stick. (laughs) No, well, thank you very much. Well, no, no, we're we're, we're lucky. We were very fortunate to have amazing customers, amazing investors and an amazing team of people. Mm -hmm. And we, and then you set those milestones and you start hitting them. Hmm. You know, it's really well, Jason, you know, this is very fulfilling. Mm-hmm. The idea that you're responding to a customer's needs and you're hitting those milestones for them. And, you know, I mean, we, test, we did you know, zero G test. Mm-hmm. And that's how we got to know Will Hawkins uh, for the disaster recovery specialist. And on the same flight was uh, Charlie Burgoyne and Tony from Valkyrie, mm-hmm. one of the most amazing digital, digital twinning big data companies in the world. And we're sitting there and then boom, now partner with them. They're an incredible mm-hmm. company to work with, right? We're mm-hmm. working with Canonical. I mean, Canonical. The guys who invented Ubuntu, they have been superb, the edge of network data center team. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, their CEO is a former astronaut. I mean, amazing guy, Mark Shuttleworth, who's done so much in biodiversity around the planet. So when we're, they, they get what we're doing, they grok, right? Um, so when we did our space station test, you know, we actually sent the first software-defined 
uh, data center, plus actually the first software defined payload to the space station last early last December. And we took, uh, working with Redwire, former Maiden Space, we mm -hmm. took over their, their, their 3D printer with their permission, with NASA's permission. NASA were amazing too, because you know we're saying we're sending a bunch of software to the space station that's going to form a data center and run a whole bunch of machine learning and it's going to take over a computer. Are you okay with that? And they were. And we went through so many gates, properly done. Mm -hmm. And it worked. It worked really, really well. We did it again this April. And so Canonical were amazing. You know, we got an Ubuntu uh, server and core down to less than 173 megs functional. Yes, stripped down. Of course, this is edge processing. But yes. So we've been like knocking it out of the park, making history and not telling anyone. Mm. Why? <laughs> right? Because our goal is the customer. Are the customers happy? Mm -hmm. How do we get more customers? How do we keep this growing? Because you know, we really have an, an incredible mission to fulfill on this. When we, you know, this literally is saving Earth's data. Not, I mean, some amazing people like the Art Mission and others, they do these archival things and that's fantastic. No, we're talking living, breathing disaster recovery as a service. As you know, 60 to 90 day immutable stacks, mm -hmm. you know, under SEC code, I think 1784A. I mean, all sorts of good stuff, right? We've been, it's been amazing. People say, Chris, we haven't seen you at any satellite conferences. And I'm like, I know, I've been at data center conferences. Mm. No, I mean, I'm learning, mm -hmm. we're learning a new industry, right? Yeah. This is the first time yeah. we're bringing cloud and satellite verticals together. People are doing data centers in orbit, as they should. Yes, please, more of. Awesome, right? Mm -hmm. what, what Starlink is doing, what Lightspeed, OneWeb, all these guys are doing. It's incredible. And they're working with AWS and Microsoft Space Azure and Google Cloud and Equinix. Wow, what they're doing is just superb. We're data storage. And that's, you know, it's not latency dependent, but we can do return to operation five seconds anywhere on the planet. Hmm. That's yeah, fast. It's, really, <laughs> it's fast. Well, the thing is, because we're using, because we're using living storage devices. Hmm. So we're not on tape, right? We're not on tape. We're not okay. stuck in a mountain somewhere. And that, the mountains are lovely places, mm -hmm. yeah. but we're, you know, using Geosat tech. So it's, in essence, we're putting it, the Geosat on the surface of the moon. It doesn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly stable. And we take it out from there. Okay. And uh, heat dissipation, I imagine, is a slightly different kind of problem there than on the surface of the Earth. So, Chris, yeah, just, just, just yeah. as is for any other satellite. Yeah. And yeah. the nice thing is, you know, the Chinese have been active on the South Lunar Pole with rovers, mm. uh, robotic rovers. And uh, they've got a radio astronomy satellite orbiting with the Dutch. And they've been using radio thermal electric generators to power things through the night. I mean, they've basically been de risking a lot of tech for us, as did the mm. Apollo and as did mm. others. And yeah, it's the same. Look, you're still in orbit. You're still in vacuum. Mm -hmm. And you've got a little bit of extra thermal loading during lunar day and, and, and decoupling at lunar night, etc. But mm -hmm. all known, all well understood. So that was the thing. When we talked to the amazing investor, we said physics, mm -hmm. tick. Market, tick. People, yes. So mm -hmm. like the big triumvirate. Yep. <laughs> then now we just have to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's answer this question then, because yeah. I went around to a couple of, of uh, private friends and mentioned, you know, some people who, who know you were on my show a couple of times before and, and your history in the field. And uh, I said, look, if anybody else came up to me and said they were going to do this, I'd, I'd kind of giggle. Right. But if it's Chris Stott, nah, it's it's real. <laughs> you know? uh, but why is it cheaper to build a data center on the moon than here on Earth? Oh, no, well, thank you very much. Yeah. No, Jason, thank you. I mean, well, thank you, too, sincerely. <laughs> oh, but we love the fact that people yeah. think we're crazy right now. Yeah. It's awesome because it means we can get so much more done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the, I mean, the Chinese have just filed a patent for a lunar data center. So the Chinese mm. government have figured out we're not that crazy. Mm -hmm. Right? And we're like, oh, okay, we better get, a, you know, we're, <laughs> we're accelerating the pace a little bit, right? And so, you know, others are going, oh, my gosh, wait a minute, there is a market there. And I'm like, yeah. yes, yeah, come on, more the merrier, right? So, but why is it cheaper to do this on the moon than say in orbit mm -hmm. first, right? Because you know, you want global coverage. And so global coverage means through a satellite means either a mm -hmm. constellation in low earth orbit or mid earth orbit, or it means a minimum, maybe more of three geosats. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and then we're looking at eventually building exabyte scale or even zettabyte scale facilities. Mm -hmm. There are things to match the exabyte scale facilities of the Bumble Hive in Utah and more, right? So you're going to put that into a constellation. You've got constant launch, constant resupply, constant replenishments. Yeah. You've got Moore's law. You've got a debris environment. You've got spectrum issues. You could be doing everything wonderfully fine. And you're still in Putin's shooting gallery. Mm -hmm. 
right? You have no idea what could be going on around you. Uh, same thing at Mio. Mio is a great place, but again, you've got to put a lot of stuff up there. You've got to keep it working. You've got to keep replenishing it. Mm -hmm. Same at Geo. We have some amazingly large satellites at Geo for commercial use. Uh, like, I mean, I didn't, I, you know, I mentioned Telstar on purpose before because, you know, Telstar do amazing things with their Geo fleet. And incredible. I was just Viasat and Echostar and HughesNet and SkyPerfect, JSAT and Intelsat and MOSAT. And if I've missed you, forgive me, right? Because you do, do amazing stuff. But if we want to put exabyte level up there, how do we do it? And then how do we do data sovereignty? Hosted payloads, yes, but more than that. And so that's when we started looking at the surface of the moon because of the NASA CLIPS program, Commercial Lunar Payload Services, Intuitive Machines, Astrobotic, Firefly, Mast, and others more like coming. They sell by the kilogram a flight up to the moon. NASA is a commercial customer. And it's wonderful because it means companies like us, we can just go buy a kilogram and fly something for less than the price of putting a small set in LEO. We're like, wow. And then the first thing we did so my hands here, you can't even see my hands. I was like, ah, the first thing we did, right, was working and, and with Dell Smith, who's our chief policy advisor, who's our original general counsel. Dell's amazing. And so the first thing we did was we looked at the regulatory environment and said, okay, how do we do this? How do we look at spectrum from the ITU, first mm -hmm. off? And we made our spectrum filings. First thing we did when, when Scout Ventures joined us, they got- I can imagine, given your background. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, what's the longest lead time, right? The mm -hmm. longest lead time is, is spectrum. So let's get right. that ball rolling now so we can use it when we need to use it. Right. And the same thing, we looked at the moon uh, from a sovereignty point of view. I mean, of course, the moon is not sovereign under the Outer Space Treaty. And uh, that's, you know, and the registration liability conventions mean you have uh, any nation states that license and operate you to go there, have a continuing uh, responsibility for supervision and jurisdiction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We actually did a fantastic paper. If anyone has insomnia, please contact <laughs> me. I will send you the paper that Dell and I wrote. We find it fascinating. It's fantastic. We did it for the American Bar Association at their request. Okay. And it was on lunar jurisdiction. Yeah. And so you have Dell, former partner, and ran the satellite practice at Denton's and Jones Day, two of the world's largest law firms. Not by accident, because he's really good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, he was one of the first ever space lawyers, went to Cambridge and learned, shared a room with Von Braun. My goodness. Mm -hmm. General counsel of Comsat, you know, the US member of, of Intelsat before everything private. I mean, the man. And we just sat down and went, right, here's how it works. You know, of course, the law applies. It's just like being in Leo, Geo, Mio. There's a couple of little provisions on the moon. Boom. So regulatory, yes. But here's the thing. Moon is not sovereign. So when you land on the moon on an American lander, it's like landing on Washington, D.C. Hmm. You land Washington on the moon. And you can have hosted payloads, which are sovereign hmm. as per hosted payloads, as per satellite law. So you have your embassies, your digital embassies, your hmm. digital twins, okay. and it works. It hmm. actually works from a regulatory point of view. Hmm. Like, okay, big tick in the box. And then we went, you know, and you can build out on the surface of the moon. It's fantastic. And so we can actually build out on a stable platform. We can link devices to each other. We're in 24 hour a day line of sight to planet Earth. Mm. Right. So it's great. Like down mm. to the surface of the planet. Yeah. Yeah. We don't need to use satellite relays. And huh. we're like, this is superb for us. Right. This is what we want to do. You know, eventually I want every man, woman and child to be able to walk outside, look up to the moon and go, oh, our data is safe up there, right? <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, you know, no matter what's happening in their life around them at the time, right? because you can see the moon. It's a huge psychological bonus and benefit. Yeah. So there's that. And then, you know, yeah, look, it is cheaper to operate. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious me. Absolutely. Well, so, so, Jason, what are the three largest costs? I don't know. I was going to interview you. What are the three <laughs> largest costs of running a terrestrial data center? I would imagine the property the land that it's on, um, the electricity to keep things going and uh, mm -hmm. something to do with heat dissipation, probably. Uh, yeah. Although those two yeah. are probably related, but those no, are my, those are head. my guesses. Okay. Excellent. No, excellent guesses. Cause you weren't expecting that. So excellent yeah. guesses. Yeah. Really, truly. Right. Yeah. Well, the land is technically free on the moon. It's first come mm -hmm. first served. And you have to be using it, doing it properly. And of course you're mm -hmm. well regulated by your nation state, of course. Right. The electricity, to power things, we're using space rated electronics. So instead of using 800 watts in the rack, we use eight. It's normal for the satellite world. Mm -hmm. But here's the real kicker. On Earth, you spend an enormous amount of time in infrastructure, hardware, and electricity to keep things cold. Mm -hmm. Even in sunlight on the moon, our first payload is at minus 40 degrees Celsius. The heat it generates, we're like, ooh. Yes, we have radiators to just monitor that, make sure it's okay, but we're like, ooh. 
we don't have the cooling cost. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, for those, for those listening, it's, it's, that can be 60 to 70 to 80% of the annual operating cost of a data center. And the annual operating cost of a data center is equal to the cost of building the entire thing, right? Your one year OPEX is actually equal to one year to the three or four years CAPEX you had to do to build the place. And then of course the cost of communications, yeah. you know, cable fiber, all this kind of good stuff. Well, we have the spectrum in the spectrum. Mm -hmm. oh. I'm like, boom. So our OPEX is radically reduced. Mm. And yet our performance is enhanced and we can see the entire planet every 24 hours a day. Right. So people can back up, refresh and restore because this isn't people doing video games and swiping credit cards and stock trading. Of course not. That's what Starlink, Lightspeed, OneWeb and the others mm. are for in low Earth orbit and, and O3B in, in mid Earth orbit. Of course they are, and GeoBirds. That's not us. We're storing it. But it's there, it's immutable, it's smart storage as a service. You can get in, you can see it, you can, you know, change it because it's immutable, but you can run your big data analytics on things. This isn't, like I said, putting things on magnetic tape and forgetting them or having someone retire at the company. You're like, where's, where's that? Oh, Joe knew where that was. Where's Joe? Well, he, right. he had his retirement party last week, but no one knows how to get into Joe's computer. What? No, this is living, breathing, a new form of storage, a new form of offering just when we need it the most. I mean, from a day-to-day -day business operational point, regulated, regulated data, we can do data sovereignty, data, uh, it, I get so excited by this. And that's why we did this. That's why I left my position at Mansa. Catherine's mm -hmm. running it amazing, the team. Mm. Okay, I should have done it sooner. She's doing a much better job than I ever did. Yeah. All right, I know I'm on record saying that, Catherine, you are. I, I'm just non-exec chair. September, 2019, I became full-time at Lone Star because I got so captivated by the customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was just talking to them, listening to their problems and going, oh my gosh, space can solve so much of this for you. And while we're doing it, we're helping the biosphere and we're helping the mm -hmm. customers and we're helping the entire human race. I mean, it's Larry Niven, who's the patron mm -hmm. of the Institute of Space Commerce, uh, said that the dinosaurs became extinct because they didn't have a space program, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's on us. Fool, all the fools are us, right? If mm -hmm. we don't save our data and protect it somewhere where it's not going to get hit by something not going to get frozen in the middle of a Texas winter and run out of diesel mm. fuel or Strasbourg mm -hmm. when a massive data center fire is going to happen. You would be amazed. I, I'm, it's kind of like a oh, the great book, Nicole Perloff. This is how they tell me the world ends. Came out about two years ago. It's catching on a little bit now. Mm. And oh my gosh, if, if you want to read a horror story, forget Frankenstein, forget Dracula, right? Forget Freddy Krueger or whatever the latest Korean horror yeah. movie is. And they're quite terrifying. I watched them. Grab a copy of Nicole Perloff's book read it in broad daylight sunny day outside mm -hmm. and you will get chills mm. as to what is happening to our data and not just the data that you and i generate but the data that runs the software that runs the oil refineries that runs the aviation that runs trains that runs mm. banks that all the attacks that happened with the not petia in, in 2017 that are happening as we speak from since january 1st to today i'm looking at my computer it's june 27th i looked it up there have been over 14 million cyber attacks in Europe alone. Mm. And I'm not talking ransomware and I'm not talking someone grabbing 14 million outright cyber attacks. Right. I mean, it's getting outrageous out there. Yeah. And yet we're heading into a, a, a technological and wonder of a civilization that relies upon data more and more. So we have to save the mission critical stuff. Mm. It is a premium service to start. And that's where we're starting. Okay. I think there's a, yeah, an education component, like you just pointed out, for the average Joe on the street, including me, uh, who ought to know better. I mean, I, I subscribe to something called the CyberWire that tells me mm -hmm. about attacks every day. <laughs> but uh, I think, again, being fortunate and having customers approach you, the, the high-end, that data processing niche, they already know. Right, what the, what the terrifying exactly. issues are. So oh, exactly. they're educating yes. you, right? And then you can yes. say, "Oh boy, well that doesn't need to happen." Are there any uh, steps, I guess, uh, that we haven't discussed about implementing your solution? Like, have you picked out uh, a site? Um, you know, launch providers. We mentioned that really quickly uh, by the kilogram to send stuff up there, and that it was really cost effective. Um, you know, are, are there any? commercial data storage or transmission equipment modifications that need to be figured out to have it survive in the, the lunar environment? 
Um, well, let's let, oh, so, no, so yeah. the great thing is we're working with intuitive machines for our first mm -hmm. two missions under contract, a great team of people, mm. and they've already chosen the Falcon 9 for both yeah. of those two okay. first, first two missions, okay. which is fantastic, right? It's great. Helps us get insurance too, yeah. which is really good. Mm. And Skycorp have, uh, they're building our first payload for us. They're up to Santa Clara. Great team of people over there. They actually have some of the polar fire chips that we're using up on the space station, actually not on, but outside the space station, outside the Kibo module, mm. uh, the Jackson module right now. And they've been through a couple of solar storms and we've been testing radiation and doing great things. In the, and look, time out, 30 years in the industry, we know low earth orbit is like a kiddie pool compared to the radiation you find in Geo and the Van Allen belts. Of course we do. And the moon is actually a little more benign, not mm. much, but a little more. So of course radiation is a big concern for us. And we're testing that on our first mission as well. Uh, comms, the great thing is this isn't Apollo. Apollo was amazing, but mm -hmm. they had to build all their ground-based infrastructure. Now we just lease it. I mean, this okay. is the most amazing thing for us because everything comes together like an integrator. Yeah. Now, but the one thing that has taken us by surprise though, Jason, and the, the sort of appetite for this is, so there we are, we've got storage, you know, setting up a miniature data center in a box. Mm -hmm. And we have, uh, you know, Polify chips. We're using, you know, Polify, the great. But it gives us the ability using risk five and we just uh, got Ubuntu to load up. Thank you, Canonical, and thank you, the team at Skycorp. That was amazing. And so, right, we're like, you know, making, you know pushing, pushing boundaries all the time. But the thing that's really surprised us is the appetite for edge processing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with that, we started to get phone calls from people saying, hey, Chris, we hear you have storage. Well, yeah, we hear you have a microchip up there that runs pretty modern software. Like, yeah, why wouldn't we? And they said, well, could we do the following with you? And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> another set of customers. Right. Well, hello, come on in. <laughs> yes, and that's been really good too. And that's been amazing for us because we're able to help and support other people going to the moon. And I know Talos Alenia and AWS have got contracts with NASA and ESA to do uh, edge processing data centers in the 2027, 20, 2030 timeframe. That's on their websites at least. Um, but, you know, we're doing it now. We're doing, we're launching next year. And okay. the idea being that we're taking the internet to the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, we're expanding. Well, I mean, the internet's already out. It's already out, out beyond the solar system of Voyager and it's on Mars. Oh my gosh, the guys doing Mars helicopters at Caltech and JPL, mm -hmm. please. They do not get enough praise. I mean, they are flying a helicopter on Mars using a Snapdragon and Ubuntu. Amazing, mm -hmm. incredible. So when people say to us, well, how do we know this is going to work? I said, they're flying right, the right. Much farther away. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And Using a mobile. Snapdragon. Yeah, Snapdragon right. chip with Ubuntu. We're right. just we're just we're just three seconds around trip. And they go, What do you mean? I'm like, the mm. moon, latency. Yeah. That's, okay, Jason, you and I are gonna send I know this, that. Send it, send it, yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. gonna go to the moon and back, right? Yeah. One, two, three. Boom, we just did it. Mm -hmm. Through the moon and back. That's the lit. <laughs> I can get well, I just say Paramount Plus, please. I love you guys, but please, when I get when I go for my Star Trek. I, I do want it to load a bit faster than that, right? And so, yes. And so, but this edge processing has really taken us by surprise. And greatly so. We're very happy hmm. for it. Because we're yeah. enabling others, other entrepreneurs, universities, and other parts of governments do amazing things just by taking something we take for granted down here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, storage and edge processing, um, putting it on the very literal edge. Yeah, we're having fun. Right. Right. Like a the, cloud. So yeah. that the timeline for you to be operational and moving customer data is when? Uh, this time next year. A, a year. Okay. Not just for the yeah. initial launch, but for the setup and. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're doing, we're doing a in. quick test okay. with Intuitive Machines okay. on the first mission of Refresh Restore. Yeah. We're very excited about that. More news coming about that soon. And, uh, you know, because we have to choose which document do we send to the moon? Which, which is the first <laughs> document in all of human history to go <laughs> to the moon for storage, right? And yeah. we're making a big announcement okay. about this. It's, okay. it's kind of a very cool thing. It's, it's, and, it's the, and it's the right thing to go to. It's very cool. Hmm. And which one gets sent back first? Refresh, restore, right? So we're doing that. And that will be on their first mission, their first scheduled mission, Intuitive Machines 1. On their yeah. second scheduled mission, Intuitive Machines 2, that's when our first one kilogram data center goes up. And we have some more news about that coming soon as well. Okay. But where do we go? We go wherever yeah. they go. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We're hitchhiking. Yeah, you're... Uh, right, eventually sure. we have a site located that we want to go when we have our own missions that we purchase entirely turnkey from people like mm. Astro, Astrobotic or Intuitive Machines mm -hmm. or whoever it's going to be, right? I mean, yeah. but yeah, ab yes.
See, I don't get to talk about this stuff much. It's been bottled really? up in me for That's three true. years. You can't tell, can you? Yeah. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, I'm yeah. one of the first people that you could talk to about it. That's cool. Um, regarding the, the edge computing. That's that's interesting because you know I've, I've talked with Rick Ward at Orbit's Edge a couple of times, um, and I think in their situation, oh, great you know, yeah, they have they have stuff. they have wonderful ideas. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure about the capitalization, right, and and the just the resources that you guys have been able to put together, um, but it's definitely needed. So, are you guys tapping into the the deep space network? No, no. Okay, so that's its own Absolutely its not. own no. separate thing. All right. No, no, we're, um, we're using commercial spectral filings at the mm -hmm. ITU, using the yeah. moon as a reference body. Actually, yeah. I think ours are the first X-band and KA-band commercial spectral filings for the moon. Okay. Uh, we're the sec second on S-band, hmm. I believe, uh, for TT and C. Okay. Oh, no, no, what, what, what things, well, a couple of reasons why. Yeah. Number one is we can't. The DSN <laughs> is literally for government use only. Yeah. Back when I was at Lockheed Martin working on the CSOP program, uh, the DSN was under my purview as part of my, my portfolio, that my part mm -hmm. of the commercialization obviously did various things there mm. and learned very rapidly there can be no commercial use of the deep space network mm. plus it is an amazing network and it's already super busy yes it is it's yeah. already overloaded it's incredibly overloaded i mean yeah. they're building more they're, they're refreshing and doing great stuff and i'm expanding it out because we're going to need a lot more of it so we can't legally use it and number two it's super busy yeah. and we're like yeah no we'll just use commercial sites we'll just keep it all commercial we do not want to get in the way of government mm -hmm. You know, they're doing incredible things. They've got their own missions to do. And it's not our role as a commercial mm. company to in any way, shape or form and impinge on what they're doing. No, no, no. We're like, we're like the satellite operators. Yeah. You guys can do <laughs> your stuff. We're commercial. We're going to do our stuff. And we're, we're quite separate in a very, very good supportive way. Mm. Now, we, we look in awe at what they're doing at, at JPL and Goddard and more. I mean, they're incredible people. And the things they do mm. are like mind blowing. And it allows us to do the very simple things. Mm. They're very, you know, you know, the, compared to what flying helicopters on Mars, we're just putting a data center on the moon, <laughs> right? I mean, come on. I mean, so just. It allows, uh, she wants. <laughs> I like where yeah, this is they, going. Yeah. Normalization. <laughs> it is absolutely you know? yes, and, and it's yes. It's, yeah. it's somewhat modular, so you could fly new. Uh, how are you going to assemble this stuff? Is that is that going to be done robotically um, with like- Oh, the, when remote... we get up to the exabyte level and, yeah. and zettabyte yeah. level. Yeah, we have yeah. a vision for, for robotics okay. and, and okay. doing things there. Oh no, quite rightly. But again, yeah. a couple of years from now when everyone's ready to go, otherwise we just fly self-contained units. Yeah. So, uh, ah, but you, yeah. But you, you yeah. mentioned something really interesting though. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned normalization. Mm -hmm. So there we were in the 1960s, right? Uh, and we had Gagarin in 50, sorry, Sputnik 57, Gagarin in mm -hmm. 61, along with Shepard and Glenn in 61, right? I think I'm right on that. It's been a long day. It is Monday afternoon. But then, you know, just as we were going back to the moon and exploring and doing these incredible things, the first ever ComSat, Telstar mm. 1, flew in 1962. Mm. And we, you know, we really do look to the satellite industry and we have the satellite uh, operators as an incredibly innovative business model, executive model, company model, market model, but also for historical analogy. And as you said, for mm. normalization. So, yeah, before we'd actually put anything on the moon, we were already flying comsats, mm -hmm. commercial communication satellites. And I love that because yeah. that's what we're doing. Everyone else is exploring the moon. Yes, so cool. Finally, after all these years going back, it's about mm -hmm. time we had a permanent presence. It's about time mm -hmm. the free peoples of the world went back to the moon. Right. I mean, you know, the tyrants are out there. It's about time that the free people mm -hmm. went back. So let's go. And at the same time, we're just leveraging the same kind of technology but mm -hmm. we're reflecting back on earth for a communications uh, application which is exactly what comsats did in the early days and hats off to them too they right. paved the way for us thank you sir arthur clark <laughs> right yes who invented the concept that's right um yeah always a history lesson <laughs> Chris here, folks and that's that's very valuable because i love knowing where we came from and how we got here that is that is critical to me so Chris, let's wrap up here, I guess. Uh, how should early adopters who want to bring this technology uh, on board contact you? How should they be reaching out? Oh, thank you. Well, Lone Star mm -hmm. Luna, like Lone Star, L-U-N-A-R.com. Come through the site to us. Come find us on LinkedIn. Come find me on LinkedIn or just drop me an email, chris at lonestarluna.com or inquiries at lonestarluna.com and all that kind of good stuff. We're out there. We're now public. Mm -hmm. Not publicly traded, but as in out of stealth. So yeah, yeah please come find us and 
If you can't find us, just Google Lunar Data Centers and we come up right out. <laughs> I, would I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, there'll be links in the description below uh, in this episode. Chris, thanks a lot for doing this. It's great to catch up again. No, Jason, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for having me. And uh, it's just great to talk. So, you know, if you think I'm like this on this, get me on the phone. I'm even worse. So, <laughs> great. Thank you. Thanks for joining Chris Dot and myself here on the Cold Star Project. This is Jason Kanigan, the founder of Cold Star Tech. We do design work for satellite projects. We do that. But I have found that people in the space industry want to be the tinkerers. They want to do the engineering work. And so our main focus is on business development processes and installing systems and other processes for improving operations of space and defense firms. If that's something you're curious as to whether we could help you with, just shoot me a LinkedIn message. That's probably the best way to do it. And we'll take it from there. I look forward to talking to you about your situation and we'll see you next time.